I'm Nicole Goldman. Um, I head up uh, marketing and PR at the Jim Henson Company, and it is such a treasure to sit with you guys. What a joy for me. Hi. Um, so we're here to talk about the legacy of Jim Henson and thinking of the Dark Crystal. The heart of the Dark Crystal, of course, is Jim Henson. So I love that we're um, taking some time to think a little bit about his legacy. So I'm here with Lisa Henson, who, of course, is the CEO of the Jim Henson Company. Cheryl Henson. Yes. <laughs> Cheryl Henson is the president of the Henson Foundation. And um, Heather Henson, who is the founder of Green Feather Foundation, which you may know as Ibex Puppetry. Um, and they also do handmade puppet dreams, which I love, and a contemporary puppet artist as well. So the questions that we hear so much about growing up Henson um, comes up a lot. The idea of art happening at home as well as in the workplace, what that environment was like. I wanted to give you guys sort of a chance to maybe correct the record. Sometimes I hear about, you know, were the puppets real? Did we play with them? How, you know, what was that like? So if anybody wants to kind of speak to maybe that environment, I think that would maybe be just a good jump off. Um, I feel like we had a very creative home, and um, we were talking about a playful home and a playful family. And I feel like our parents really encouraged us to be to be creators, to be makers. My mom um, did her degree in art education, and um, she was a real craftsperson. And so we always had rooms in the homes that were about making, and I think that was really important. Yeah. When you think about like the work that Jim was doing and how involved you were, I know Lisa and we were talking about the pictures that you took for that. Uh, I love that picture that you have of back of Jim. Um, but that came from just how you were experiencing or you can probably explain that photo better, but yeah. Well, I, um, I have a lot of memories of being uh, under the stages where the puppeteers were, were performing because there are monitors sort of everywhere under these mazes of, of um, raised sta stages. And you could actually sort of um, plant yourself next to a monitor under a stage and maybe do your homework whilst <laughs> watching the show <laughs> and seeing the show of the puppeteers from below. Um, so I, I mean, I wasn't there all the time, but that was a one really great experience. We were also always welcomed into the puppet workshop. And the people who um, built the puppets were so welcoming to these children. Like, well, what were we doing there? They made <laughs> us feel important. They gave us little jobs. And, um, you know, we felt a part of it. We truly yeah. did. There's a really great photograph that you'll see in some of the books of Lisa as a baby asleep in a box underneath the stage with our parents uh, puppeteering above her. And so I think that memory of being under the stage must go all the way back. <laughs> I've seen that, and I've also seen the, the grip pushing you in the carriage while they're working, where he's like, you know, calling the you know, scene and kind of rocking, which is great. Um, I, just in terms of the workshop being close to this, the set on the Muppet Show, um, definitely the puppet workshop is right next to it, and I loved going to that puppet workshop. And I was young enough that I was on the set a lot as a little kid hanging out. But I remember Miss Piggy's closet was right there, and I would raid her closet and try on her outfits. And, <laughs> and you know, some of them didn't all fit because I think, you know, the the of course the waist was way too small. But the over the jackets and stuff I would put on, and I'm sure they didn't want me doing that, but they were very nice to let me do that. <laughs> uh, do you have a do you remember a favorite outfit? Uh, no. Oh, okay. no. I'm gonna, I could do a like panel on this boa. topic alone. It was this long closet. I don't know if you guys remember it. This long closet with like all this amazing outfits. It was so I much fun. I love that. <laughs> That's incredible. I didn't know that. That's amazing. Well, when, when you think about going to set and being involved in those projects so much, you know, I, I was joking earlier that, you know, it's, it was a little like bring your daughter to work day every day or, you know, but, but you also were involved in specific projects, you know, so even, you know, after Dark Crystal, and we will talk about Dark Crystal, don't worry, but the, um, but, you know, I wanted to think a little bit about like the storyteller project that you worked on, Lisa, with Jim. I think that's so interesting. Yeah, that was actually later. I was, um, I was majoring in folklore and mythology and 
um, I was so struck by how wonderful um, the original folklore, folk tales were, even the Grimm's ones that we thought we knew, know so well. And um, I, ended, I pitched that uh, whole show of the of Storyteller to my dad. Um, but I was not a writer, so Anthony Minghella really wrote it, and Duncan Kenworthy really produced it. But you know that was that was something I ended up talking to him a lot, about a lot. And then of course Cheryl, you know, was very close with Jim when uh, he was coming up with Dark Crystal. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little little bit about that because I know the the folklore of the beginning of Dark Crystal, the snowstorm, the hotel, the Howard Johnson's hotel, the well, yellow legal pad. Go ahead. I was going to say it goes back even farther because uh, my father had seen the wonderful book. He was presented it. Um, by the head of licensing, Jerry Houle, and uh, saw Brian's illustrations, and uh, they set up a meeting. He was so enamored of Brian's work. And, and the, the characters that Brian drew already had a three-dimensional quality. They already had a sense of really being alive. And um, so my memory goes back to my father's first drive, uh, to just the two of us driving down to Chagford, and as many of you might know, Chagford is on the edge of Dartmoor in, uh, in Devon. And um, it is a gorgeous location. And we went to visit Brian, who was sharing a house with the artist Alan Lee. And so many of you will know Alan Lee's work from Lord of the Rings. But at the time, Brian and Alan shared this house, and Brian had the top floor little garret apartment. And the whole thing of going through the moors and going to Wistman's Wood, which many people, which some people know of, where the whole environment really feels like the world, the land of Froud, and how alive it all was. And um, so, yeah, I was a, I like to say I was the first fan of the Dark Crystal because I was a huge fan of the Dark Crystal long before it was even made because just the concept of the Dark Crystal is something that I was completely enamored of. And was he talking about it as like, I'm gonna be doing this big thing. Everybody buckle up, I'm gonna, you know, like could you tell it was coming as this like, you know, he talks about it as, you know, his his biggest adventure. I'm just yeah. curious, was it, you know, could you tell that it was different than the Emmett Otter or the Muppet Show, you know, these yeah. other projects? Do you have any recollection of that? I'm just curious. He really wanted to do it as a feature film, to do an epic, and this concept of epic and feature film and really world building. And it was all about building the world from the ground up and every little tiny detail being new and different and of that world rather than of our world. And Brian was the perfect person to partner with on doing that. Yeah, and mm -hmm. when you're working on the set alongside these mm -hmm. artists, you know, the, you know, we were, some people were touring the creature shop this morning. We were talking about like the beginnings of the creature shop coming from that film. How, how different was that kind of workshop from maybe the Muppet Show the workshop? Muppet Show workshop. Yeah. Well, you know, that group of artists or a, the, the core group of artists were brought together in New York first. And so Brian Froud moved to New York and it was set up on a separate floor in the same building as the Muppet workshop in, the, in New York City on 67th Street, and so that group was already starting to experiment, but it was almost all experimentation. And what never happens today in feature films is the idea of building, building the materials, building everything from the ground up before there's even a script, before there's even an outline for a script. And um, so I think that was particularly unique. And the, the year that I took to work in the workshop between high school and college, so much of it was experimentation. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to work with the team that was working with the Oxford Film um, Company, Oxford Scientific Film, where they had these um, special uh, tele tel telescopic cameras where you could film um, miniature worlds. And so the idea was really taking what is the, the miniature worlds within our world being inspired by our nature, but then building up up big and so I was making a big giant rock that came to life it was a really unique opportunity to experiment and right. I think all of the artists were experimenting so, continuously so since you said experiment can we has, have people been up to the museum yet so can we just pause about the clothes in the museum because <laughs> <Let's talk. laughs> you were there 
so, so you know, you don't you don't necessarily think that that's going to be a part of the movie, but it really kind of was a part of that process with those people. And I'm just curious to know what your recollections were of that. And you're in the pictures. Yeah, in those pictures, they're so crazy. To me, that's a, a very different time because the period leading up to production was all the experimentation in the materials and the natural world. I actually think in some ways the Dark Crystal Fashion Collection is, an, is a precursor to Labyrinth rather than the Dark Crystal. So, um, for example, Ellis Flight, who is one of the main designers on the, um, on the fashion collection, went on to be the costume designer of the Labyrinth. And so, uh, so to me, those are sort of two separate periods, hmm. if that makes sense. It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's, so, so we're going to shift a little bit, kind of. When you think of the Dark Crystal as, you know, 40 years ago, so much um, work that Jim did after that we're here now, the legacy of Jim's body of work overall, including the Dark Crystal, is really something I want to make sure we have a, a time to talk about. I think that um, we were talking right before this, and I kind of wanted to pick that conversation up. The idea of, hopefully you guys have had a chance to meet some of the puppeteers that are here. You know, puppeteers don't come out of nowhere. Um, we need to train them and find them. And I wanted to really hear your thought on that because you're in that world really meeting so many different artists through the movies and all of that. Yeah, I guess um, in my world, um, in my company, um, Ibex Puppetry, we do a lot of um, opening up the door for the entry point into puppetry for a lot of people through both. Um, we have a Puppet Slam network, which kind of um, allows, makes these venues possible for people to do their puppetry. And then we have Hamney Puppet Dreams, which is an entry point for um, new puppet films, puppet filmmakers. But um, and, and yeah. Where do, where do people wanna... see those movies? Because I would love to, especially there's, I love Toby's, do we know? Uh, um, yeah, we had Toby's film. Um, can I say something about my inspiration with Dark Crystal? Please, of course. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. I, I want to hear it all. Just, I want, when we were doing all those research times, I love the real um, trips of research that we did to Stonehenge and castles and meeting all those people in Oxford Scientific and all of that stuff. I just feel, I don't know, I was really, really inspired by that. And then the experiments that were going on on, that, on the third floor. Anyway, I just and that was like, they were, so you were doing trips it. kind of looking at different I, visual yeah, locations? Yeah, I don't know if they were directly for the Dark Crystal, but those trips that we were doing, I thought were just really, anyway, really special. I yeah. A little comment no, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I didn't know, know that. So, I'll, just, <laughs> I, I'll just point out that for the, that year um, between 79 and 80, that our fam part of our family moved to London. And so Heather came over and went to school that year. I had taken a year off um, before college. And so we had the, and my brother John and both of my parents were in London. And Brian Froud and so many of the people involved with Dark Crystal were really fascinated by the Celtic culture, by the ancient British uh, Druid culture, by really looking at the inspiration um, for what they were building. And there's a, such a deep connection. Mm -hmm. And so we did do a lot of field trips. Mm -hmm. It was also very fun to be a family in that, <laughs> in that period of time, being interested in that world. Yeah. yeah, I think my dad really loved living in London in this, like, where you could visit all these old ancient places that we don't, you know, that kind of history, cultural history isn't in the country as, as much. Mm -hmm. so, or it is, but it's different. So yeah. um, that was a really... I just really love that opportunity. I don't, yeah, that film had to have been made in, in had to be done in, there in England. Yeah. 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 Well, looking at, um, just thinking about other ways that we're continuing to yes, right. build that puppetry legacy, legacy right. specifically, of course, yes. leads us to Jim Henson Foundation. And yes. I want to talk about that too. So, Absolutely. yeah. So tell me about um, that. So the Jim Henson Foundation was started in 1982 and, um, uh, it w is specifically to support American, innovative contemporary American puppet theater. So since 1982, we've given over a thousand grants to over 360 different puppet companies and artists. And it's really about supporting a, a range of puppet styles. Um, we actually do not support Muppet style. We support almost everything else. Um, and I've been the president for 30 years. And um, 
we really we have a great website. Please check it out. We have a really we support a really wide range of work, and um, we really we have a great newsletter that goes out every week that um, that lets people know about puppetry happening and and um, how you can see it. Great. And then the stuff that we do is a little bit more entry level into it. So we really encourage like your everyone has like a local puppet guild that can join and to work on puppetry and has a community of puppetry out there and then. That's where we are really trying to spread the, the joy of puppetry and the joy of creativity and giving people opportunities to get into this field. There, thank you. The other part, of course, of Jim's legacy is the world's building that we're doing at the company. I get to work alongside Lisa every day, which is really one of the gifts in my life. But when we're thinking of Jim's legacy, the work at the company, do you want to speak to that a bit? Well, yes, it, I mean, it's a balance because the, what I'm taking care of is the company and our employees are working on a lot of properties that we own, but it's only sort of one of, as we say, the three legs of the stool of the traditional Jim Henson properties because Disney has the Muppets, Sesame Workshop has Sesame Street, and then the Jim Henson Company, we have Fraggle Rock, Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, and a number of other things. So, you know, all of this is Jim Henson's legacy, as well as people who are not here, you know, the people who are working on the Muppets at Disney and the people who are taking care of our beautiful collection of puppets at the Center for Puppetry Arts. You know, it's really not on any one person's shoulders to continue the legacy. Um, but for me, I'm very um, development oriented. I'm a, I want, I've been a producer or an executive my entire adult life. And so, you know, I, I am about trying to find specifically television shows that we can put on the air, films that we can get made. And, um, and like, I don't, I think if I was the only person working on Jim's legacy, we would be missing so much because we'd be missing all of what they're doing as, as well as other people. Yeah, that's great. And, and let's talk, you mentioned it quickly, but the CPA and Momi, if people haven't heard, um, is the place to go and make sure to see Jim's collections. And I know you've and all done And to see Dark Crystal right. puppets. Uh, yes. Just to explain, <laughs> MOMI is the Museum of the Moving Image, and it's in Queens, which is just over the bridge from Manhattan in New York. And, Center for, and CPA is Center for Puppetry Arts, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So we do have some time for questions. I want to make sure, if you have any questions, please come to the mic. Our brother Brian does a fantastic job of maintaining the legacy as well, and he's um, on a trip right now. Um, but if you were of here course. on the stage, it, would be, it is very important to say that Brian is just making great stuff. Well, let's just say about Brian that he, amongst the many other things that you guys love him for, he um, he personally really shoulders responsibility for training new puppeteers at the various highest level. Um, and, you know, whether it is bringing in new diverse uh, talents or bringing more women into our, into our ranks as puppeteers, you know, he takes the professional training of puppeteers very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. And if you're local, please go to puppetup.com and sign up for his mailing list. <laughs> he would be so grateful. <laughs> Great, go ahead. Yeah, so... Part of your father's legacy, in my opinion, is, is this tremendous fan base. And the nature of fans in the last few decades has changed. Our power has increased. So do you have marching orders for those of us who want to see more from the world of Thra? I love that you asked that question. <laughs> you know, a couple, of, a couple of years ago, we were at um, Comic-Con, I think, and we were reflecting on all the, the success of our fan contest winners, as well as fan contest participants, whether you won or not. And particularly with Dark Crystal, we've seen the influence and the creative additions that are made by fans who perhaps don't make it, um, make those contributions in the, under the auspices of only being a fan, but being a fan, entering a contest, getting selected, getting, being on the team, but whether you have Joey Lee writing like half the, the canon of Dark Crystal 
and coming out of a fan contest to um, Kristen Delesky, who's here and, you know, has been working with us and, um, uh, of course, Bobby Bennett, who won the, the Creature Shop Challenge. You know, so we, we've been, um, we would like to launch some more uh, contests, for sure, um, because we think, you know, there are contests here, but when, that you guys are running and, and winning prizes at, but when we run a contest, there is a, there is a greater chance of fan direct participation in the Dark Crystal. Hello, uh, thank you for all your stories and information. Uh, my question is, are there any stories that you uh, could share with us about your father that don't necessarily involve the films? Just something from him on a personal level that might remain in your mind that might be interesting for us to hear. Thank you. Hmm. Do we know any stories? No, like, <laughs> was he a good cook? Did everybody get grounded? I'm giving you some prompts. This is, you know. Well, I'll, I was just in London a couple of weeks ago for the opening of Totoro, which is a fantastic stage production at the Royal Shakespeare uh, Company did at the Barbican. And um, walking on the heath. And so there's a big park near our house in London. And um, my father loved to walk on the heath. And um, he would often do walking meetings where he would meet with somebody and do the entire conversation while walking on the heath. And so I think the whole thing of connecting to nature and walking and going out on the heath is something that all of us have very, very fond memories of with our father. I would think about uh, flying on an airplane with him because he considered airplane time to be um, very, very important brainstorming time. So where most of us are just bringing a snack and a neck pillow. He was bringing a uh, yellow pad, brand new pens, and you know, would just like lay it all out and be like, I will brainstorm now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he actually, the whole thing of being up in the air and when you're up in the air that you're disconnected from the, the worry and the burden of um, the down below. And I think he really enjoyed uh, brainstorming while in the air. Great. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, thank you so much for, for your generosity with your, your time and being with us here um, this weekend. Um, I've heard Jim Henson described as an experimental filmmaker who happened to use, you know, puppets as a medium. And of course, you, you know, his short film and The Dark Crystal being a live action film with no humans in it. Uh, I just wonder, do you, do you think that's a fair label? Do you have any reaction to that? I'd say that he was, he was a puppeteer first, and then an experimental filmmaker, and then combined everything. But I would say he's an artist of all genres, because when he was in college, he was making some beautiful paintings. He did some great albums. He put out, um, you can still find it online, it's called Countryside and something, TikToks, TikTok 6. Anyway, he made some great, like, like these one-off albums, these songs that he just created and put out there. I always thought that was really fascinating, and they're kind of like this beatnik um, rap little, like, like you know, rhythm um, talk pieces. And I think it's really cool that he was doing all these different genres at that time, a little painting, a little music, and then doing some, yeah, he, well, that was, yeah, he made his, he had a little business in college of making posters for um, all the different events in college, like the prom and all those things. So he's a multifaceted artist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for being an inspiration to women everywhere. Um, but also, uh, I just wanted to know what your favorite puppet was from either The Muppet Show, Dark Crystal, or Labyrinth. Kermit, you know, I love listening to some of those. Um, I, I think maybe Spotify does it. Anyway, so there's like this Muppet Radio that's that I don't know if anyone has found it online. It's amazing. Um, it's Muppet Radio. It's coming out of Canada. I don't know. It's some, they find all the songs that ever have come out. They like play like commercial. It's so. It's anyway. It's very. The deep it, cut. It's a deep. It is. Yeah. I don't know who puts it out. You probably know some Muppet fan group. They're probably but, here. <laughs> but anyway, when the songs come on in their Kermit's voice, I love it. That is just really, really close to home. Um, um, when I hear my dad's voice in Kermit, it's just, it just really, I mean, that character was closer to him. It is, it is his little doppelganger. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to weigh in? Um, well, my favorite Muppet is Rolf also because it was performed by 
Jim, and it was, um, you know, it was a different side of his personality from Kermit. And then I just never really thought about what my absolute favorite puppet is, but it, um, it might be the Chamberlain, <laughs> I think. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Just because there's so many great. When I was a kid, my favorite was Robin the Frog. And when he did um, The Frog Prince, I was, I think, nine, nine or 10 years old. And I was on the set, and I completely fell in love with Robin. And so my father actually gave me one of the Robins um, to, to have as my very own. And um, I would practice my puppetry with my own little Robin. And I also, I was in love with Jerry Nelson's voice. I think that Jerry Nelson just has the most beautiful, beautiful um, heartfelt voice, singing voice in particular. Um, and, but then over the years, I've just loved different characters in different shows as we go through. That's great. T.R. Rooster, I'm just gonna add another one. <laughs> T.R. Rooster from Musicians of Bremen. Thank you all very much. I'm, I'm so grateful that everybody was able to join us for this panel. Thank you. I'm honored to sit up here with you. These women inspire me regularly. Thank you. It's a pleasure to work with you every day. Thank you all so much for coming. And I think that wraps up our panel. Yeah, the Skeksis are coming. Bye. The Skeksis are coming. The Skeksis are coming. You better go. Yeah. <laughs>